Hello to you. I do hope you're well. Welcome to this A-Level Religious Studies video. I'm Ben Wardle and today we are looking at meta-ethics, which is all about taking a step back and asking the big fundamental question in ethics, which is what is the good? And we'll be looking at three different approaches to answering this question. We'll be looking at naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. So yes, meta-ethics. It's all about taking a step back and taking a bird's eye view where you ask that fundamental key question, what actually is the good? And as I say, we're going to have a look at the AO1 and AO2 for three different approaches. We'll be looking at naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. And there's lots of opportunities here for us to be, of course, critiquing each of these and also comparing the three of them. And then at the end of the video, we'll actually be asking is asking what is the good the most important question in ethics or are normative ethics and applied ethics more important? So let's get started, shall we, with the keywords. And our first keyword is, of course, meta ethics, because this is the area of ethics where we take that step back and we take that bird's eye view, because it's where we ask fundamental questions about the meaning of ethics itself and in particular the meaning of good but also it means of course asking what is good what is right what is wrong so it is all about this fundamental key question and so metaethics involves discussion and debate about the nature and purpose of morality and we're going to be looking as I say at these three different approaches at naturalism and intuitionism which are examples of moral realism and then emotivism which is an example of moral anti-realism and we'll be making lots of links and connections to religious language and the verification principle when we are looking at emotivism because it is principally associated with AJ Eyre. And of course, we know him very well from our religious language studies. So just to put this into context for you, within ethics, we have three different tiers of ethics. We've got meta-ethics at the top, which is big ethics, the bird's eye view. We've then got normative ethics. And then just below that, we've got applied ethics. And we've already looked at normative ethics on our journey on the course so far. Because normative ethics is what we call first order ethical questions about how we should behave and what ethical norms we should follow. So this is what we could call normal everyday ethics. And we've looked at and we've evaluated many examples. We've looked at natural moral law, haven't we? But we've also looked at situation ethics and utilitarianism. Now, interestingly, natural moral law and utilitarianism are both examples of naturalism. So we have already had a look at naturalism. Today, of course, we'll also be looking at intuitionism and G.E. Moore's idea that goodness is a simple concept self-evident to us, much like the colour yellow. It's not something we can define, but it's something that we can intuitively identify. Uh, and then, of course, we'll also be looking at emotivism. But yes, when we've studied natural moral law and utilitarianism, we have been looking at examples there of theological naturalism and ethical naturalism. But we'll look at that in much more detail as we go through this video. The other area of ethics, just to mention, is applied ethics, which, again, we've already started looking at. So this is where we apply those normative principles and arguments, so where we apply, you know, natural moral law, situation ethics and utilitarianism to particular areas. So, you know, medical ethics, animal ethics, business ethics, for example, where we're actually applying those uh, moral approaches to different issues. And we're seeing, you know, well, what would a utilitarian say about this? And we're asking, what would St. Thomas Aquinas have made of this issue? We then have, and again, there's a lot of key terms here, but really important that we do understand them at the start of the video, so then we can discuss these key terms as we go through the video. So we've got moral realism, and this is uh, the belief that right and wrong objectively exist independently from the mind. So in other words, right and wrong are out there for us to discover. So they do objectively exist. So they are real properties, we could say. So they can be discovered via observation, which is what a naturalist would say. That's what ethical naturalism is all about or intuitively. And that's what intuitionism is all about. But with moral realism, it's the idea that morality is real. It is a real thing that exists that we need to discover. 
because then in contrast to that, we have moral anti-realism. And that is the belief that right and wrong do not actually objectively exist independently from the mind. So they are not real things. And examples of this would be emotivism and prescriptivism. So emotivism, just very quickly before we talk about it later, is the idea that moral judgments are just expressions of opinion. They're just expressions of an emotion, that they're not actually factual statements. And of course, this is very reminiscent of the verification principle. And AJF believes that ethical statements are meaningless, that they are just personal preferences, that in the same way you might say that you like a certain food, you might say whether you like murder or stealing. So, you know, with an emotivist perspective on ethics, any ethical statement, any ethical judgment is simply an expression of your personal opinion, because right and wrong do not objectively exist. They're not to be discovered by us. We decide in that moment, based on our feelings, how we feel about that issue. So whether we think it's right or wrong. So this reduces morality, this reduces ethics to personal opinions and preferences. We then have two other contrasting terms, cognitivism and non-cognitivism. So cognitivism is the belief that moral statements are subject to being either true or false. They are meaningful. So I feel like I'm back doing religious language again. Whereas non-cognitivism is the belief that moral statements are not subject to truth or falsity. They are meaningless. And again, that's what your emotivist would believe. Uh, and we will be coming back to those terms as we go through today's video. We then have highlighted in yellow, just to emphasise how important they are, naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. So they are our free approaches to metaethics. So naturalism is that moral values can be correctly defined by observation of the natural world. So Aquinas develops theological naturalism and then uh, Bentham develops his ethical naturalism based, of course, on his assertion that nature has placed mankind under two sovereign masters, pleasure and pain. And so he assumes that pleasure is the good and that pain is bad. Um, intuitionism, then, which is developed by G.E. Moore, is that moral truths are indefinable and self-evident. So the good cannot be defined by us. It is intuitively known. And he was very critical of naturalism. He uh, developed something called the naturalistic fallacy. And he said we can't assume that something being natural means that it is good. He said that instead the good is intuitively known to us much like the colour yellow. It is something that we can identify, but we can't actually explain or define it. So it's self-evident. So we should intuitively, we should instinctively, I suppose you could say, just know what the good is. And then emotivism is the idea that moral statements are not statements of fact, but they are indicators of an emotional state or personal opinion. And then the final key word there is the naturalistic fallacy. And this was G.E. Moore's criticism of naturalism that we cannot uh, assume that just because something is natural, it must be good. So we will be coming back to that when we look at our AO2 for naturalism, but a great critique there that shows us why G.E. Moore was not happy with Bentham's approach, that just because nature has placed us under this master of pleasure, we shouldn't necessarily see that as the good for us to be pursuing. As I've said, G.E. Moore instead believed that goodness is something we can't define. It's just self-evident. It's just intuitively known by us. So, Let's get started, shall we? Today's video is going to cover those three main approaches, naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. So I really look forward to seeing your responses in the comments. Please do let me know which of these approaches to metaethics you are personally impressed by. Which one do you think is, you know, most in sync with your thinking on this question of what is the good and how do we discover the good? So, as I mentioned before, we've got these three tiers of ethics. We've got normative ethics, applied ethics and metaethics. And we have metaethics at the very top because this is your big fundamental question. It's where you're taking that step back and you're taking that bird's eye view and you're asking, what is the good? And we're going to look at naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. There is then a separate video for you if you're doing the AQA specification on divine command theory. So please do have a look at that. But just to, again, put this into context, the other tiers of ethics are normative ethics, which is how do we do good? And then applied ethics is how do we apply the good, really? How do we apply the approach? And one question that I want us to start considering is whether metaethics is the most important type of ethics. 
do we need to establish what is the good before we can actually practice normative ethics and think about how do we do good? And then, of course, then apply that to specific scenarios with applied ethics. So some people say that metaethics is too remote and it's too abstract, you know, it's too theoretical. So we shouldn't spend time studying it because we should focus on how we actually apply ethics. You know, we want to be pragmatic about it. But then others would say that actually metaethics is essential because if we don't establish what is the good and how we know the good, then how can we do normative ethics? And then how can we apply that when we're doing applied ethics? So at the end of the video, we will be asking, is metaethics the most important area of ethics? So just start thinking, you know, do you believe metaethics is the most important area or actually, should we focus on something that's a bit more practical and a bit more relevant uh, to everyday life? So, for example, thinking about our normative approaches and how we apply them. So, as we mentioned when we looked at our keywords, we need to know that there is a contrast between moral realism and moral anti-realism. And I want to give you a bit more detail on these at the start of the video, and then we'll be able to see how naturalism and intuitionism are examples of moral realism, and then emotivism is an example of moral anti-realism. Now, for me, the best way to remember these is by thinking of the two Ds, okay? So, moral realism is about discovery, that there is moral truth for us to discover, either through observation or intuition, whereas moral anti-realism is the idea, and I apologise that it's covered up there by me, <laughs> I do apologise for that, but moral anti-realism is the idea that we actually decide for ourselves what we think is right or wrong. And that, of course, reduces morality to a matter of personal opinion. So morality isn't real if you like. It's not independent from us for us to discover, but it's actually just our personal opinions and our feelings and preferences. So moral realism. This is the belief that right and wrong objectively exist independently from the mind. So in other words, they are real properties. There are mind independent external moral properties and facts for example, murder is wrong is a moral fact because the act of murder has the moral property of wrongness. So it's the idea that murder is wrong is not an opinion. It's a moral truth for us to discover. So that would suggest if it's for us to discover that it independently exists and it objectively exists. So, of course, with moral realism, it's all about morality being objective and it's about morality being discovered by us. And our examples are naturalism and intuitionism. In contrast, then, moral anti-realism is this idea here that right and wrong do not objectively exist independently from the mind. So there are lots of different anti-realist theories about morality. So, for example, you know, some people believe that moral language is an attempt to make a claim about objective properties, but that it fails. And we know that as error theory. Um, but there's other approaches, for example, that actually when you're making a moral statement, you're not attempting to assert a truth claim at all. You're or just expressing an emotion or you're prescribing what someone should do. Um, now, this is really interesting because, as I say, it reduces morality to personal opinion. And that would suggest, Mary Midgley wrote, that nothing can be known in the sphere of morals because moral judgments are just the same as having a, you know, a personal preference for a certain food, for example. And the implication, of course, is, well, what do we do in terms of the law? Because if all morality is just a matter of personal opinion, then what can we actually have objective, clear rules about? Because you could say murder is wrong and I might say I don't feel the same way. And then how do we actually establish a consensus so that we can agree within a community, a society or indeed the whole world of what is right and what is wrong? So, you know, moral anti-realism is this idea of us deciding for ourselves what is right, what is wrong. Um, and of course, we have to think about the implications of that in terms of what actually happens then to morality, you know, if everything is just a personal opinion or preference. So plenty to talk about today. As you can see, I hope matter ethics is a really fascinating area of ethics that, you know, gets us asking a lot of questions. And it really makes us think about some of the morals and some of the, you know, theories that we've already discussed on the course um, and actually what their foundations are. So, metaethics. 
just to recap again this big picture that metaethics is before we actually start to break each of these theories down. Metaethics is about big questions. And the big question we're asking is what is the good? So naturalism would say the good is what is natural. It is known by looking at nature and what comes naturally to us. Intuitionism would say that the good is a simple notion that is known by intuition, so it is self-evident, we just know it. Divine command theory is the idea that the good is whatever God has commanded, and that of course leads to the euthyphro dilemma. And then emotivism, the good is a subjective matter of personal opinion, it is an expression of an emotion. So they are, in a nutshell, the answers that the different theories give to the meta-ethical question, what is the good? And for each of these, we are going to look at your AO1 knowledge, we'll be looking at the scholars and what they've said, and we'll be doing our AO2 evaluation as well. So we'll look at the strengths and the weaknesses of naturalism, intuitionism, and emotivism. And yeah, I would love to hear what you think in terms of which of these theories, which of these approaches gives the best answer to the big meta-ethical question of what is the good? So. If you have downloaded the PowerPoint, you might like to print this slide off here and then actually fill in the key AO1 knowledge and then the AO2 strengths and weaknesses as we go through the video. So that might help you in terms of your note taking today. Uh, but that sort of, you know, puts onto one page, I suppose, the key things you need to know about metaethics in terms of you need to know your key AO1 knowledge and you then need to know your strengths of each approach and then the criticisms as well. So just one final thing before I promise we are going to get started with naturalism. And this is the open question argument by G.E. Moore, who will talk about when we criticise naturalism and when we look at intuitionism. And he said, is it true that what is natural is good? So that is what he calls the naturalistic fallacy, because he says it's not. He says we can't just assume that what is natural is therefore good. OK, but that is a question I want you to start thinking about. Is it true that what is natural to us is good? Because two people who would say, yes, it is, are Thomas Aquinas and Jeremy Bentham. So let's have a look. You see, I promised we're actually going to get started. And now we are. So naturalism, the idea that moral values can be correctly discovered by observation of the natural world. So Ethical naturalism is the belief that moral values can be discovered by observation of the world. So what is right and wrong can be established by looking at the world around us. So, of course, via empirical observation. And this is therefore a moral realist theory. So we're now applying the key words because it's based on the idea that moral facts and truths actually exist because they are out there for us to discover through observation. And it is therefore also cognitivist because statements about morality are either objectively true or false. And that would mean, of course, that for an ethical naturalist, ethical statements are meaningful because you are empirically observing something, which means that it is then seen as a moral fact, as a moral truth that is objectively right, because you are discovering moral values that are out there and you're doing so empirically through observation. So let's have a look at some case studies. Hopefully you recognise this man here, Thomas Aquinas, because his natural moral law is an example of theological naturalism. And that's because it's based on the idea that the world has a God-given order built into it. And so moral values can be worked out by understanding our God-given purpose and observing the natural order. And that, of course, leads to the idea that there is one right way to live by living in accordance with the natural moral law. You know, those primary precepts are not subjective. He doesn't say decide your own primary precepts based on your own observations. He says that if we all use right reason in accordance with nature, we will all agree with him that they are five primary precepts that have not been invented, but they are to be discovered. Yep. So it's the idea that there is one right way to live. It's a moral absolutist approach because you have discovered it through right reason in accordance with nature. And that is why there are five primary precepts that are binding upon all people at all times. 
And then we have another example for you, Jeremy Bentham, because remember, utilitarian thinkers, Jeremy Bentham, and then, of course, John Stuart Mill, who developed utilitarianism with his rule, utilitarianism, believed that humans can discover right and wrong by discovering what actions lead to pleasure or pain. Remember, their normative ethical theory of utilitarianism is all about doing what is useful for maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. And that's based on the understanding that what is good is pleasure because that is what comes naturally to us and so their entire ethical theory with the hedonic calculus for example is all about working towards pleasure because Bentham has said that through observation we can see pleasure is the good and the brilliant quote just such a great quote that you know Bentham writes is nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters so he's literally you know ex explicitly mentioning naturalism there isn't he because he's saying nature has done this and so we need to discover what nature has done so nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters pain and pleasure it is for them alone to point out what we ought to do as well as to determine what we shall do so of course this is the best quote whenever you're talking about naturalism because he's literally saying that because something is natural we need to use that as our idea of the good or that that tells us maybe I should word that a little bit better, that tells us what is the good. So he's saying that because um, pleasure is something we naturally seek and pain is something we naturally avoid, that means they must be good, bad, right and wrong. And so this is such a great, clear example of ethical naturalism, isn't it? Because he's saying that we can discover goodness, we can discover morality, moral truth, moral absolutes by observing the natural world around us. So, you know, this is something that he he more than criticizes because he says you can't just assume that because pleasure is something that seems natural to us it must be good he said the goodness is something else good is something we know intuitively uh, but for Bentham he is saying that because pleasure is something we naturally seek that must be the good we need to work towards and that's why utilitarianism is all about doing whatever is useful for maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain and then just another example, F.H. Bradley here argued that it is possible to understand our moral duties in life by observing our position or station in life. So, you know, a nice link actually here to Kantian ethics. You know, let's bring all of the normative ethical theories in if we can. He said that what he has to do depends on what his place is what his function is, and that all comes from his station in the organism. So again, it's this idea that through observation, we can understand moral values and moral absolutes. So as I say, you know, we've brought in Aquinas here, we've brought in Bentham here, and we've got Bradley, who's making a nice link for us to Kantian ethics. So, you know, a lot of what we've talked about when we've been looking at our normative ethics has been based on ethical naturalism. And, you know, that shows, doesn't it, the relationship between normative ethics and meta-ethics because utilitarianism for example is completely dependent on accepting Bentham's definition of pleasure equaling good so as you can imagine you know there's a lot of discussion about whether that is correct and we're going to have a look at the AOT for naturalism now so let's start with the strengths shall we let's start with the positives our first strength of naturalism is that of course it makes morality objective doesn't it because you know it therefore or I should say uh, the reason this is good is that it therefore gives it importance, you know. So let's have a look. Naturalism makes morality objective rather than subjective. Therefore, morality is universal. And we could say this gives morality importance rather than just being a matter of personal opinion, which is what emotivism would reduce it to. So if you want to compare it with emotivism, you could say that this is a much better approach because it makes morality objective, therefore giving it importance. So if we look at, uh, you know, the fact of naturalism, it gives morality a set of absolutes. Yeah, they are to be discovered. They are moral absolutes to be discovered. There are moral truths for us to discover. Uh, so, for example, that murder is wrong or that rape is wrong. Those assertions would not be matters of personal opinion. They would not be meaningless. They would be, you know, meaningful assertions of moral truth that you have observed, that you have discovered. A second strength, then, is that it fits with widely used normative ethical theories, as we know, because we've just mentioned, haven't we, natural moral law and utilitarianism. 
So we can say a strength of this is that it fits with widely used normative theories such as natural moral law with Aquinas and utilitarianism with Bentham. It is a popular approach to understanding morality that clearly has real world relevance because, of course, ethical naturalism clearly underpins many of those normative ethical theories. So it shows it's got that direct relevance to everyday moral decision making. So it can help us understand, can't it, the foundations of the normative ethical theories that different people use and that we have been studying. In terms of the weaknesses, though, we've got two. The first one is from David Hume, who we will be talking about today when we mention um, emotivism. But always great to bring in David Hume. He's got a lot to say about a lot of the topics on the course, hasn't he? And he argued that no matter how closely we examine a situation, we cannot see or we cannot observe empirically the rightness or wrongness of the action. OK, this is a really important point, And he calls it the is ought distinction. And this is the idea that there is a difference between what you can observe is factually the case and what we think ought to happen. So there is a big difference between what you um, empirically observe, which he is saying is neutral because it is just an observation. And then there is this jump, if you like, this bridge to your judgment about it, to the perspective you then have on it. So, for example, he killed someone is what factually happened. And Hume says that is something that we can empirically observe. However, he says we cannot empirically observe that it is wrong to kill someone. He says we can see what happened, and that is, is, yes, yeah, so that is what actually happened. But then your judgment about what happened is not something that you empirically observe. That is something separate that you come up with yourself. That is based on your interpretation of the event, because, you know, we could both see the same person being killed. And the fact is that they were killed. Your interpretation of that could be, this is awful. How could that happen? My interpretation could be, Great. Well done. I never liked him anyway. Of course, just for the avoidance of doubt, I would never say that about death. Um, absolutely not. But the point is, you know, what we empirically see is different, Hume is saying, from what we then understand of that or our opinion on that. So Hume, as it says here, proposes that is or distinction, that although we can observe a situation and we can see what happened empirically, we cannot see the rightness or the wrongness of that. As I say, the act is pretty much neutral because then morality kicks in in terms of our perspective, our interpretation, our beliefs, our opinions about what we've seen. So that is the is or distinction. And then very similar to this, actually, is G.E. Moore's naturalistic fallacy, because he identifies the naturalistic fallacy as the key error that naturalism makes. And we will talk about him in a moment when we discuss intuitionism, because he says that is a much better answer to the question of what is the good. But his point here, and as I say, you know, this is very relevant to Jeremy Bentham's quote on nature placing us under these sovereign masters. He says that just because something is natural, we should not assume that it is good. So for each natural property, we can still ask, is it really good? So, for example, is pleasure really good? So Hume is saying, OK, nature has placed us under this sovereign master pleasure. But then more is saying, but we could then still ask, but is pleasure good? We can't then just assume, OK, because it's natural, it must be good. He says we can still then ask another question, which is, but is pleasure really good? And the fact that the answer could be no means natural properties cannot just be assumed to be the same as good. There is actually a difference between something being natural and something being good. To make that assumption that just because something is natural, that means it is good, which is literally what uh, Bentham writes in Utilitarianism, then you know, that, that's the assumption that's without foundation. You, you know, it's a leap in logic, which, of course, the fallacy is, isn't it? You're making an assumption without any foundation, without any reason to do so. So that is G.E. Moore's criticism of naturalism, that just because something is natural, we shouldn't assume it is good. So that leads us on very nicely to G.E. Moore's own answer to the question of what is the good, which is intuitionism. And intuitionism is the idea that moral truths are indefinable and self 
evident. And this is the idea that we don't discover them through observation, but we discover them by intuition. So we know right and wrong by intuition. And the key example that we're going to talk about here is the colour yellow. OK, so Moore says that the colour yellow, like goodness, is a simple concept. So it's indefinable and self-evident. So when we see the colour yellow, we can instantly identify that is yellow. But if someone then asks you to explain what is yellow, we just have to say, well, it's yellow. We can see it, but we can't describe it. And in the same way, um, he says, Moore says that goodness is known by intuition, that we can see goodness, we can know goodness, but we can't define it. So it is a simple concept that is indefinable and self-evident. And of course, your key critical analysis here is going to be, well, if everybody just had this intuitive knowledge of good, why don't they do it? You know, clearly different people do have different ideas of what is good because they, you know, they do have different morals and they do have different moral values. So let's just have a look at the key facts here. So intuitionism believes that moral truths can't be discovered by observation of the world. Right and wrong can't be discovered. Instead, they are self-evident. So they are known by us intuitively. So with intuitionism, it is, you know, a rejection of this observation of nature. Because remember, G.E. Moore said with the naturalistic fallacy, just because something is natural, we can't assume it is good. That is a leap in logic that we shouldn't be making. He said, instead, we know right and wrong by intuition. So we do see, however, you know, even though, of course, it's very different from naturalism in terms of it saying that you can't um, empirically observe good in nature, you just intuitively know it. There are similarities between naturalism and intuitionism in the sense that they are both moral realist and they are both cognitivist. Yeah, because it is the idea that there are moral truths. But of course, for more and intuitionists, those moral truths are not to be empirically observed and discovered in the world around you. You discover them intuitively. You just know them. So I suppose discover is stretching it a bit with intuitionism because actually you don't need to do much work. You don't need to do much digging, so to speak, because you just know it. It's self-evident to you. So here is G.E. Moore in his little suit and his little tie on. And he argued, as I say, for intuitionism. And remember, he says we don't recognise goodness through empirical fact. The good is self-evident to our intuition. And that is because good is a simple concept that we just know intuitively. It is self-evident to us all. And the example that I mentioned before is of the colour yellow. So he said, if we were asked to describe yellow, we would find it difficult to do so. We only answer the question of what is yellow by pointing out an object that is yellow. So it's self-evident to us and we can identify it, but we cannot define it. And he said that in the same way, we are able to recognise goodness. It cannot be defined, but it can only be shown and known. So this is based on Moore's idea that there is a difference between simple and complex ideas. And a complex idea is one that we can break down and explain, whereas a simple one is self-evident and it should just be known intuitively. So he gives the example of a horse as a complex idea because, um, you know, a horse can be broken down into its parts. So if someone said, you know, well, what is the horse? Explain to me, describe it to me. You could say, well, it's got a leg, it's got a neck, etc. You know, you can break it down and you can explain it in that sense. Whereas simple ideas such as the colour yellow or the concept of goodness for more cannot be broken down into parts or divided. He said that goodness is a simple idea and that simple ideas are grasped by intuition. So again, it's about moral uh, realism and again, it's cognitivist. But it's the idea that the moral truths are indefinable and self-evident. So essentially, the good is the good. That's it. Full stop. That's how Moore would put it. And my key question here is, do people just know what is the good? Are we all, um, you know, equipped with this self-awareness, if you like, or this sense of, you know, intuition of what goodness is? Do people have that? Is that something that people actually have? Now, here's what Moore wrote in his text, Principa Ethica. He said, if I am asked what is good, my answer is that good is good. So, you know, that's a great quote to memorise and use in the exam, isn't it? That you could just say, Moore says that good is good. So the only way you can define good is with the word good. In the same way that you could only say yellow is yellow, you can only say good is good. That's it. That's how he feels about this. 
Uh, and he said, and that is the end of the matter. So he wasn't, you know, wasn't interested in pursuing this any further. He said, good is good. And that's it. Um, and he said, or if I am asked, how is good to be defined? My answer is that it cannot be defined. <laughs> And he goes on to say, and that is all I have to say about it. So there we go. The case is closed. Good is good. And it cannot be defined. Full stop. There's intuitionism for you. Solved. Sorted. There's metaethics. The question, what is the good? More's answer. Good is good. And that's the end of the story. So metaethics is solved. We can all stand down. We don't need to do any more thinking about this fundamental question. So again, really great to memorize that actually and use that in the exam that more literally writes the good is good, and that is the end of the matter. So in terms of his answer to this metaethical question of what is the good, his answer is very straightforward. It's very simple, isn't it? And it is, you know, very concise that good is good. There you go. Done. Finished. So do you agree with more that we can't actually define the good? It's just intuitively known by us and self-evident to us. Well, Let's do our evaluation. We'll start again with our strengths. Then we can say that, again, a strength of this is that it presents morality as objective because it's based uh, on the idea that the good is objective because the good is the good. Yeah, full stop. So the good is the good. So it's not about your idea of the good or their idea of the good. It's the idea there is this objective good that is intuitively known, that is self-evident to us all. So this is, again, an example of moral realism. And of course, it sets the moral standard. And this means that morality is consistent and clear. And we can say that this is supported by the fact that people do actually universally agree on certain moral values and issues. So we could say, you know, is the fact that if we look around the world, every country does seem to have laws against murder, for example. Does that show us that there are certain things that are self-evident to humans as being good? So if we do look at universal values and universal laws that we find in every corner of the world, does that not show us that actually good is self-evident, that everybody knows what good is? Um, so, you know, that's an interesting strength that we can use, that it's a it's a strength because it presents morality's objective. So we can be very clear that the good is good uh, and it's not a matter of personal opinion. But at the same time, you can add on to that, that we can see this in action. Yeah. Although Moore didn't like us to empirically observe morality, uh, we can actually see that around the world, there are many moral values that are universally shared. And so does that not demonstrate that everybody has this self-evident understanding uh, or that it is a self-evident understanding we all have of good? So. That's an interesting strength, isn't it? And we could also say, of course, that it avoids the naturalistic fallacy. So if you were comparing it with um, naturalism, you could say that intuitionism has got the edge over naturalism uh, because it avoids the naturalistic fallacy. You know, it maintains the idea of uh, morality being objective and it is still a moral realist theory but this is without the naturalistic fallacy so it may be seen as better than naturalism because it avoids the fallacy of assuming that just because something is natural it must be good intuitionism says that morality is not discovered empirically but is known intuitively so as uh, more wrote good is good and that is all. So you could say that that is a strength and that, you know, makes it much better than um, naturalism because it avoids the naturalistic fallacy. Uh, but of course, you could say that actually just saying good is good doesn't give us any meaningful knowledge at all. In terms of the weaknesses, then, we could say that a problem with this is that people have different ideas of the good. So if you're saying that goodness is intuitively known, different people's intuitions seem to be telling them different things about what the good is. So not everybody has the same idea of goodness. People's intuitions do seem to differ. And that undermines the idea that an objective good is intuitively known. Mackey, for example, argued that this suggests our idea of good is the result of social conditioning, not intuitionism. So the way we've been raised, the moral values we've been instilled with, the things we've seen around us in the society we've been brought up in. You know, your idea of good, he believed, is shaped by your upbringing and it is shaped by the society that you're in. So two people born in, you know, two different countries will have a different idea of what the good is based on the relative norms and values of that culture. And so, of course, this presents a problem, doesn't it, for Moore and his idea that the good is good and that is all, because that suggests 
that everybody's got a different idea of good. And that, of course, undermines the idea that this presents morality as objective, because if everybody's got a different understanding of good, that reduces intuitionism to being a subjective uh, answer to the question of what is the good. And another problem, of course, is how do we resolve conflicts of intuition? So, you know, this is meant to be a very simple concept, according to Moore, but actually it's becoming very, very complex, isn't it? And very difficult for us to actually establish what the good is when we do see these conflicts and we do consider that different people have different understandings of good. And then another weakness for you, we're going to bring in emotivism here because AJS said that good is a matter of personal preference or it is a uh, evincing of an emotion, not, importantly, intuition. So Air would reject the idea of non-natural moral properties that we intuit as unverifiable and meaningless. So he would say that, you know, his assertion, Moore's assertion that good is good is absolutely meaningless and absolutely ludicrous. He instead argues that morality is a matter of personal preference and opinion. It is the expression of an emotion, not something we know via intuition. So you can see here again how we can compare these different theories and these different answers to the question, what is the good? Because for Air, he would say that, you know, our ideas of goodness are expressions of opinions um, and the expressions of an emotion rather than something that we intuitively know through our intuition that is self-evident to us. I would say it's not self-evident, it's self-decided in that moment. So, you know, always be thinking, how can I use naturalism, intuitionism, emotivism as critiques for one another? And I think this is a great example, you know, because I often say to students, you know, I put intuitionism kind of in the middle because you've got more going over there criticising naturalism with the naturalistic fallacy. But then you've got air coming from this angle saying that intuitionism is rubbish as well, because good is a matter of personal preference, not something we know through intuition. So, you know, it's a great one when you want to be comparing to both of the other theories, because you can use intuitionism as a critique for uh, naturalism, but then you can uh, critique intuitionism with emotivism if that makes sense so yeah it's a great one when you want to showcase your ability to compare all of the theories um to be honest it is the one that i i struggle to get my head around in terms of good is good and that's all i feel like i get what he's saying i feel like i want that to be the case that we all know what the good is but then again i want to know well where did that self-evident understanding come from in the first place you know, so I feel like with more, I can see what he's trying to do. But for me, you know, it raises more questions than it provides answers. But again, great to hear what you think in the comments below. So building on that criticism there from air, we're going to move on to our final approach, which is emotivism. So the first two, as I've mentioned, were moral realist and they were cognitivist, whereas we now move on to our moral anti-realist and our non-cognitivist answer to the metaethical question, what is the good? So emotivism is the idea that moral statements are not statements of fact. I think that says, yes, it does. Thank God for that. But our expressions of emotion, they are indicators of an emotional state. So emotivism, and we associate this, as I say, with AJR, and we're going to bring in a lot of his work on religious language and um, the verification principle as we look at emotivism. But emotivism believes, or an emotivist believes, I should say, that there are no moral truths. Moral statements are based on feelings of approval or disapproval. And this is often known as the hurrah boo theory, because it's literally the idea that you are given a situation that happens, you know, so somebody is killed, for example, and you either cheer and go hurrah, that's great, or you start booing as if you're at a pantomime. So it's the idea that, again, these moral truths don't exist. That morality is just you expressing an emotion in response to something that's happened. So nothing ultimately can be known or universally established in the sphere of morals, because morality is simply a matter of personal opinion and preference. So this is obviously an anti-realist theory because it's saying there are no moral facts. Morality is just us reacting. Yeah. Think about it. Emotivism. It reminds me of emojis. It's about you reading a news story, which is just facts of what's happened, and then you react in the comments with a load of emojis. You might pick a load of happy emojis, you know, little 
smile in faces, or you might get the crying eyes emojis. So emotivism is the idea that morality is just you emotionally reacting to something that's happened. So of course it's anti-realist, you know, the morality cannot be empirically seen. It's not out there. The morality is your emotional reaction within you. So it's completely subjective. And so it is of course a non-cognitive theory as well, because uh, believing that statements made about right and wrong are not subject to truth or falsity. Yeah, you can't then say your morality is right, your morality is wrong, because for air, that would be like saying the fact that you like that food is right, the fact you don't like that food is wrong. You know, it reduces morality to personal preference, to personal taste, in the same way that you might say, I don't like fish and chips, you might say, I don't like stealing. It's not a fact to be discovered. It's something that's completely subjective to you, to your personal taste, to your personal preference, to your personal opinion. And that is why I've put there is that final bullet point, that ethical statements are expressions of opinion. Again, I think the best comparison I can make is to your taste in food. That is how air sees moral judgments. It's literally like someone saying, my favourite food is pizza. You know, he'd say, OK, well, good for you. But that's not a moral fact that we've discovered out there, is it? You know, your taste could change. You know, in 10 years time, you might say my favourite food is now pasta. I don't know, you know, do let me know what your favourite food is in the comments, by the way, guys. Always great to hear what would be your death roll meal. If you had one final meal, what would it be? Uh, just something to think about. Um, but yes, um, <laughs> completely gone off topic now, but hopefully that helps us to understand that for emotivism, morality is not something to discover. There are no moral truths. There are no moral facts. There is no objective morality all moral statements, all moral judgments are expressions of a personal opinion. They are simply you emotionally reacting, you know, typing your emoji in the comments on a news article or on a social media site. It's an emotional reaction. It's a personal preference. It's your, you know, your personal feeling about what's happened. But that's not an objective truth for us to discover. It's something you decide. It's something you feel in the moment. So AJ are here looking very emotionless, looking very austere in this photograph. I don't know where it's taken, though. It looks like it's at Buckingham Palace. You'd think he'd be a bit more excited. But no, he, uh, of course, is very familiar to us because of his work on... Um, religious language and the verification principle. And it's important to know that the background to emotivism is found in the work of the logical positivist. So you can see here that, you know, the philosophy of religion content is now actually infusing into ethics. And so it's a great opportunity for a synoptic link which is a great way to show the examiner you are an A-star candidate. Um, so remember, the logical positivist develop the verification principle for ascertaining whether a statement is meaningful. And the principle suggests that a statement is only meaningful if it is an analytic statement that is true by definition. So something like a triangle has three sides or it's a synthetic statement that can be verified by the senses. So it's empirically verifiable. And of course, as moral statements then fail this criteria, they are factually meaningless. And of course, that links in with what Hume was saying about that is or distinction, that you can't empirically observe the morality of an action. You can see what happened, but then that question of what someone ought to have done or not done is within you. That's not something you can empirically see. Now, of course, you could argue, well, you can see the consequences of the action. And if you can see that harm has been caused by the action, surely that shows you that that action is wrong. But again, that is still your understanding that you didn't think that harm should have been caused. And for an emotivist, all that you're doing is feeling sorry for those people if they've been harmed. So, you know, with emotivism, it's the idea all moral statements are just expressions of emotions. They are meaningless. They are non-cognitivist. And remember, AJ Eyre had two versions of the verification principle. He pioneered, he took on board the weaker version, which says we can see statements as meaningful if we can say how we could verify them in practice. But of course, even that weaker version that Eyre presents doesn't uh, meet 
um, sorry, no, even with a weaker version of verification principle, moral statements still don't meet it. There we go. Let me get my words out today. Uh, so as moral statements are neither logical nor provable by the senses, this means that they are factually meaningless. This is because emotional statements instead show emotional states or feelings. They convey an approving or disapproving tone. So it's about you saying, oh, I like that they did that or I didn't like that they did that. You're not giving a fact. It's nothing we can verify. It's nothing meaningful. It is simply an opinion. It's a reaction. It's a judgment that you are personally making that is therefore subjective to you. It is not a moral truth to be discovered. It is a personal opinion that you are expressing or to use as language that you are evincing. So this, I think, is a quote that will really help you to, you know, solidify your understanding of emotivism. So I wrote that the presence of an ethical symbol in a proposition adds nothing to its factual content. So if I say to someone, you acted wrongly in stealing that money, I am not saying anything more than if I had simply said, you stole that money, in adding that this action is wrong, I am not making any further statement about it. So moral statements add nothing of value, yeah? We, again, we bring it back to human, the is or distinction, that you can say what happened, for example, you stole that money, but then if you add on, you acted wrongly, you shouldn't have done that, that adds nothing. That just adds your personal opinion. And someone can turn around and say, well, good for you. I'm sorry you feel that way. But that's not a moral fact that you're giving. It's not a moral truth that you're asserting. You're just adding your personal opinion. And that absolutely adds nothing. As I wrote, it adds nothing to its factual content. So this is the idea that the big difference between facts and values. And you might have heard of this. It's the fact value distinction, very similar to the is or distinction. There is a significant difference between what actually happened and what you think about it. And the point here, which builds upon the verification principle and that whole discussion about the meaningfulness of language, is that just because you didn't like what happened, that doesn't make your statement meaningful. The only meaningful bit is what was empirically observed. The only meaningful bit is the facts of what happened. You then adding your personal opinion is pointless, basically. That bit is the expression of an emotion. That bit is not a moral truth. That bit is not meaningful. That is simply you adding on what you feel. And someone can turn around to you and go, well, good for you, but I disagree. So there is this significant difference between the facts which um, obviously are meaningful, and then the values or what you're saying ought to have happened, your feelings about it, your opinion about it, which Air says adds nothing to its factual content and therefore is meaningless. It is not a statement of fact. It is simply an expression of emotion or an indicator of your emotional state. And he writes this, when you do that, when you say it was wrong for you to do that, you are simply evincing, and that is the key word that he uses, my moral disapproval of it. It is as if I had said, you stole that money in a peculiar tone of horror or written it with the addition of some special exclamation marks. Yeah. Or in the modern world that you added a load of shocked, upset emojis on the end of that statement. So he is saying that all you're doing when you are making a statement where you're saying you wrongly stole that money is you are adding on your little bit of um, emotion, basically. So you might as well be adding on those emojis or, you know, if you were saying it to someone, saying it in a really shocked, appalled voice. But he says that adds nothing meaningful. If we go back, it adds nothing meaningful to its factual content. So for him, he's not interested. Remember, a key criticism of the verification principle is that it is too narrow. And one example of it being narrow is that it excludes ethical um, judgments or statements from being seen as meaningful. So for air, there's no point making these moral statements and thinking that they have authority. You know, he's quite happy for you to express your your view on what's happened, but he doesn't want you to think that that's got any meaning to it. It is simply your evincing of a view or, you know, your expression of your emotional state. So obviously with naturalism and intuitionism, there's the idea that the good can be objectively known and that there is moral truth to be discovered or to be intuitively known. Whereas for emotivism, there is no good that objectively exists. All that we have are emotional reactions to things that happen and they are meaningless. 
So, you know, obviously this one is radically different, isn't it, to naturalism and intuitionism. Uh, very quickly, before we evaluate it, another big influence on emotivism was, of course, David Hume, who we mentioned before, because he had earlier argued that moral judgments are feelings and sentiments rather than factual statements. So, you know, a strength of emotivism could be that it is consistent with the earlier thinking and writing of David Hume. He said, remember that, you know, your moral judgments cannot be empirically verified as true or false. They are the expression of an emotional response, a personal opinion. And remember, that is called the is or distinction, also known as the fact value distinction. You can empirically see the facts, you can empirically see what happened, you know, the is, but you cannot empirically see the values or what ought to have happened. They are separate. They are your emotional response. They are subjective to you. They are personal to you. And they are, in the words of air, meaningless. So just a bit more on that. Sorry, I thought we were getting on to the evaluation then. Uh, just a bit more detail on that. There is a significant difference between facts and values. And the original version of the fact value distinction is found in Hume's is or formula. And remember, is refers to the factual claims about things, how things actually are. So for example, he killed him. Ought is then your evaluative claim about how you feel that things should be. And of course, um, this reminds me of our AO1 and our AO2. Yeah, is are the facts that we uh, write down for our AO1 marks. And then ought is our evaluation and our critical analysis, which we do for our AO2 marks. So, you know, really interesting to think about how our exam is marked in this way, with this distinction between the facts and then the judgment. Um, so, of course, the facts are empirically based. He killed someone, whereas the values are emotionally based. He was wrong to kill him. You're evincing, as I uh, would say, your, your moral feeling there, your emotional reaction. Now, is this right is the question we've got to ask. You know, is it right to reduce morals and to reduce ethical statements to being expressions of emotions that we are just expressing a personal feeling, a personal preference about what we have factually observed? And remember, emotivism is about that key distinction is all facts and values um, and that our moral judgments are just these subjective personal opinions. They are our expressions of an emotion. Now, Jeffrey Warnock here believes that it seems absurd to reduce morality to emotions. Um, and I just wonder, you know, spend a couple of minutes thinking about this. What does he actually mean by that? And do you agree with him, you know, saying that to reduce morality to being the expression of an emotional opinion or reaction is absurd? What does that mean? Why does he think it's absurd? And do you agree with that? And I would certainly say we need to think about the implications, don't we? We have to think about the implications. If you're going to say that moral statements are not objectively true, but they are simply expressions of emotion, uh, what is the implication of that for ethics and for the law and for morality? You know, there is a massive implication there if you're saying that ethics and the idea of right and wrong is simply a personal emotion. It's a personal opinion, a feeling, a preference, you know, because does that then just reduce all ethical conduct to personal opinion. And so, as I say, what is the implication for the law, for example, or for morality in general? Massive, massive implications, I would say. But I wonder what you think. Do you see this in the world around you today? Do you think that the world is becoming very emotivist in terms of how people do see morals? You know, a lot of people will talk about moral standards decaying. Uh, and is that because of this growing trend towards emotivism, that everything is just my truth or your truth, how you feel, rather than there being one set standard for morality. You know, if we think back to what Cicero said, that there will be one law eternal, binding upon all people at all times, emotivism is arguing for the opposite. You know, emotivists would say there are 8 billion different personal opinions slash emotions, slash feelings about what is right and wrong. So really interesting to think about this is or distinction uh, and to think about emotivism. Should we be reducing moral statements to being expressions of emotion? Is this accurate? Can you understand the logic behind the thinking here? And is this going to be helpful for human beings as they try to, you know, navigate through the world and consider 
what it means to be moral. So lots to think about. Um, let's evaluate, shall we? Let's have a look at our strengths and weaknesses of emotivism. You could say a strength is that it promotes tolerance of different viewpoints, doesn't it? Because if there is no objective idea of what is good or bad, uh, then no one has the right to say their morality is true and another's is false. So if you want to link this to uh, the study of religion and you want to talk about exclusivism, for example, this promotes pluralism. You know, this challenges the idea of exclusivism, that one religion has a monopoly on the truth, because, you know, with emotivism, one must simply accept moral diversity in the same way that we have come to accept diversity in musical and culinary tastes. So you could say that promotes social harmony. So, you know, in the same way that you're not going to fall out with somebody over what their favourite food is or, you know, what kind of music they listen to. Well, I don't think you would anyway. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have more tolerance for people, even if they've got different moral opinions to you, because they are just opinions. And so, you know, it's not a struggle for who's right and who's wrong. Everybody can be right because, you know, it's all about their personal preference, you know, within their own little bubble, um, they can have their own opinion. So we can link that in as well, can't we, with Wittgenstein and language games that, you know, truth is relative to the form of life you're operating in and they can all be consistent because you can't then use the rules of one game to criticise and critique another because everybody's right. Everybody's got a right to have their own emotional reaction to whatever's happened, um, you know, and make their own moral judgments. Uh, and of course, another strength would be that it is supported by the verification principle, because based on the verification principle, which again, we talk about air when we talk about, it is correct to see ethical statements as meaningless because they cannot be verified. So we could say that it is right to see moral judgments as matters of personal preference because they are meaningless because they don't meet the criteria for verification. Remember that difference between is and ought. You can empirically see what happened, but you can't empirically see the rightness or the wrongness of it. That is something separate. That is then meaningless. That is personal. That is subjective to you. Uh, and of course, as I've put there, actually, this is also consistent with Hume's is or distinction based on his empirical thinking. So really interested, actually, these strengths of emotivism, that it promotes tolerance because everybody can have their personal preference for morality and that it is supported by the verification principle, which, of course, we've studied for paper one philosophy of religion. In terms of the weaknesses, though, we've got a massive problem here that is that it means there's no basis for morality. So, you know, we've got a big problem because if emotivism is correct, then morality is reduced to a matter of personal preference and opinion, isn't it? So this means that there can be no moral standards and that nothing can be definitively known in the sphere of morality. It is just an expression of feelings, nothing more substantial. And of course, if morality and if rightness and goodness is nothing more than a personal feeling or emotion that could lead to the breakdown of society. Because again, you know, how do you have a legal system, for example? How do you have rules? How do you have laws about things being right or wrong if that's just a matter of personal preference and opinion? So actually, you know, if we think about the implications of this for how society functions and how the world functions, they could be pretty major because it means there is no longer any basis for morality. And then we could add to that that, of course, it is therefore not useful for moral decision making because it undermines our attempts to make moral judgments, you know, because it reduces them to matters of personal opinion. If we cannot establish what good is, then we cannot make moral judgments. So, you know, that reaffirms, doesn't it, the importance of metaethics as foundational for the practice of normative ethics, because we need to establish what the good is. So we can then put it into action and work towards it with our normative ethical theories. So natural moral law and utilitarianism show that we do need to establish moral standards, not just express emotions. As Bentham said, nature has placed mankind under two sovereign masters. It is for them alone to determine what is right and wrong. But of course, you know, for air, absolutely not. He'd say, Bentham, that's your opinion. Good for you. You live your life by that standard. I'm going to choose something else. I'm going to feel how I emotionally react to the situation I see and then just express my opinion about it. So, of course, if you get to this position where there are no moral standards, there are no moral truths or facts, everything is a matter of personal opinion. That is then very unhelpful for uh, morality and ethics. But you could also say, couldn't you, that's very unhelpful for society when you then have no moral standards, no rules, 
no agreement on what is right or wrong because it's just a matter of personal preference and opinion. So really interesting, actually, to evaluate emotivism in terms of we've got a strength there that it promotes tolerance of different viewpoints. But then the problem with it is that it undermines the entire system of morality and the entire idea of establishing right and wrong on a universal scale. So very interesting, I think. I love love this topic. I think it's fascinating. And when we actually think about it and the implications of it for society, it's, you know, pretty major, isn't it? To say that if you are an emotivist, you could potentially end up with no basis for morality. Um, and as I say, what are the implications of that for society? So yeah, very interesting. Again, do let me know what you're thinking in the comments. Great to hear your thoughts on emotivism and of course on naturalism and intuitionism. So if we take a step back now, which, of course, we were already doing because we're doing metaethics and we actually think about these approaches from a bird's eye perspective, um, are ethical statements subjective and meaningful or are ethical statements subjective and meaningless? Well, hopefully we now know with confidence that naturalism and intuitionism both say that ethical statements are objective and meaningful. Naturalists, of course, would say that they are observed empirically, whereas intuitionists would say that they are known intuitively. And then, of course, on the other side of the table, we have emotivists. So he believes that ethical statements are subjective and meaningless because they are matters of personal preference and opinion. So no moral truths can be discovered because they don't exist. It's all a matter of personal opinion. It's your emotional reaction. It's your personal preference. It's a matter of individual taste. So the final thing we need to take a look at, as I promised at the start of the video, is this question about whether metaethics is the most important type of ethics. Remember, we looked at those three different tiers of ethics, didn't we? We looked at our metaethics, normative ethics and applied ethics. So the question we need to consider is, is what is good, which, of course, is the key metaethical question, is that the most important question in ethics or are normative and applied ethics more important? So what do we think? Yes, it is. Why might someone say metaethics is the most important type of ethics? Now that we've spent a few uh, hours, not a few hours, it feels like it. <laughs> Hopefully the video has gone very quick for you. There weren't too many adverts. Um, but now we've spent some time, I should say, thinking about this. Why might somebody say that, yes, it is the most important type of ethics? Well, we could say that meta-ethical questions need addressing first. If we are unclear on what goodness is, it is difficult to build normative theories on how we should act. And again, we see that with Bentham and his assertion about nature placing mankind under those two sovereign masters. We need to know what they are so that our ethical theory can be about working towards them. Hence, the fact utilitarianism is about doing what's useful to maximise pleasure and minimise pain. We could say the word good may mean very different things. And we know that, don't we? We've discussed that. If we each mean something different by the word, then practical ethics become very tricky. So it's very important that we answer the question, what is the good as our starting point? And then we can build our ethical theory and then apply our ethics to different situations. But we need to understand that first before we can then apply it. And we could say addressing what goodness is also affects our moral motivations. If I believe that the universe have fixed God-given standards of goodness, so, you know, natural moral law, but also divine command theory, then I may be more inclined to be good than if I think that goodness is just a subjective idea. So, of course, you know, interesting as well, when we think about emotivism, does that lead to people being immoral? Because they think that morals are just a matter of personal opinion. So you can do what you want, basically. So would that that leads to anarchy, whereas with naturalism or intuitionism and the idea that there are moral truths and therefore there are objective universal moral laws, does that encourage goodness? Because, you know, we think, right, OK, that morality has been established. It is set in stone. It is clear. I need to follow it. I need to work towards fulfilling it. Whereas if good is just whatever you feel like, it's potentially going to lead to more uh, immorality, you could argue. In terms of why someone might say metaethics is not the most important type of ethics then, well, you could say that the question of what is good is too remote and actually it's too complex. Um, there seems to be little agreement on what the answer might be. We certainly know that. We've just seen, haven't we, by looking at naturalism, intuitionism and emotivism. There are lots of different opinions. There is, you know, real contradiction in those theories. 
So it seems actually we're no further to an answer than we were at the start of the video. So we could say, you know, there's no point really spending time studying this. We should just focus on the practicalities of normative ethics. And we could say it also seems to bear little relation to the practical issues in ethics. And we could also say in terms of why it's not the most important question in ethics, that regardless of whether we answer the question of what goodness is, we are not excused then from the practicalities of needing to make ethical decisions about the issues we face. So you could say that instead of asking what is the good, we should be asking what shall I do? Um, and that could be seen as the more far pressing, um, far more pressing, sorry, more important question. Um, but I think interesting with that is surely asking what shall I do is going to be based on your answer to the question of what is the good. So, again, you know, just a little counter argument for you there in terms of the uh, answers we've got here for is matter ethics the most important type of ethics and again please do let me know in the comments below always great to hear from you what you are thinking on this and whether you you know you personally prefer naturalism intuitionism or emotivism but then also whether you think matter ethics is the most important type of ethics that we have so that is it from me thank you for watching i hope that's been helpful and good luck with your studies Take care. Bye-bye for now.